I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on Open Studio, the Obama portraits arrive in Boston. We get the inaugural impressions. Oh, literally, when I walked in, I got chills. I felt very proud. The first thing I said was, oh my God, this is so dope, um, seeing black people represented in this way. Then a return to Oz with Wicked author Gregory Maguire. Plus our weekly roundup of everything to see in Arts This Week. And the American realism of artist Amy Sherald's portrait of Michelle Obama. It's all now on Open Studio. This Museum of Fine Arts Boston Gallery is teeming with portraits of leadership, global leaders, leaders in family, community, and culture. It's all a nod to two very famous portraits behind this wall. They're making their last stop on a national tour before heading home to the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. So we came here to get people's first blush reaction to seeing the Obama portraits in person. To me, it is historical. It's groundbreaking. Uh, I love the contemporary um, perspective, but also bringing in the history and what is important to the president. I like the flowers that are represented in it, the natural environment, and just a different take than what we think of portraits. There's this long history of photography and photographs excluding the African American experience. Frederick Douglass, I think, was one of the first to get his portraits done and to be staring right into the camera. To see the president staring right out front and the first lady, Michelle Obama, looking straight out in front, it's powerful. I feel like the representation of Michelle doesn't get across her warmth and kind of her accessibility, even though I know that's what the artist Amy Sherald was looking to portray but it doesn't show her humanity as much as I wish it did. The portrait of Barack Obama is more, it feels like he's really looking at you wanting to know what you're thinking. I love the technique, the, the, the grace that the artist used to depict her and I really, really loved him. Yeah, the photorealism was pretty cool. The, the background kind of sticking over Barack's picture was really pretty neat. And the, the colors were just so vibrant. In, in contrast to each other, it's pretty cool, too, to see yeah. the two different techniques, two different styles, just completely different. They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. They're, like, chilling. I got goosebumps. Kehinde Wiley's a phenomenal painter, obviously. Like, his work is absolutely beautiful, and then Amy as well. I think she captured Michelle Obama beautifully. Seeing these pictures up close was just amazing. I didn't think that it was going to look the way that it did, nor did I realize the size difference, you know, on your phone versus in person. I remember the portraits coming out and I remember people liking the one of Michelle less and so the choice to kind of make her in the tradition of formal portraiture which is a little bit more like I am powerful and I am a little bit removed is like disjoint with our public image of her but it's absolutely in the tradition of powerful leaders right of which Michelle is obviously one as well. His face is so strong and he's so open with his collar open and leaning into the picture and I I walked around and his eye contact was with me the whole way. I really felt that he drew me into really listening and communication in a strong and compassionate way. And I loved it that such a strong person could sit in a floral arrangement representing all the places that he had lived. I wanted to cry. incredible president. And for me, who has a daughter, who dreams big, to see the president and first lady dream big and share that dream with everyone. They never give up, they never divide, and they're always like, come on for the ride and inspire. Oh, literally, when I walked in, I got chills. I felt very proud. The first thing I said was, oh my God, this is so dope. Um, seeing black people represented in this way and in such a great museum as this. And like people paying money to come in and see this. And like the elevation of black art that we've seen in the last few years has been something that I hope continued the trajectory. Happy, 
there is a joy to them. I was in tears when he won the election the first time, let alone the second time. And um, that same kind of joy definitely comes through in the paintings. Same, same feeling. It's nice to see someone being different, right? Like, it's not the traditional stuffy picture, so it's, it's just a little bit of awe and a little bit of uh, pride in, in seeing things evolve and being different. When I started reading the notes on leadership and just reflecting on what I'm looking at, I've got tears in my eyes because I think that as, as a black woman in America, it's hard, you know, and to see these influences and these leaders, you know, portrayed in this way is beautiful. Gregory Maguire, the author of the best-selling book-turned-hit musical Wicked, returns to the world of Oz with a new trilogy set in the Wicked universe, more than 25 years after the original hit shelves. Inspired by the onset of the pandemic, The Brides of Maricor dives deeper into Oz as a granddaughter of the Wicked Witch lands on the besieged island of Maricor. Gregory and I kick off the Concord Festival of Authors with a talk at the Concord Museum on Thursday. So as a preview, here again, a conversation we first brought you last fall. Gregory McGuire, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to see you again. And in person. We, we very much love that. Yeah. Well, let me start with your book. We, we thought, and I think you even said, you had kind of retired from the, the land of Oz. It seemed like a pretty definitive departure, but, and I apologize for this, but is there no place like home? Did you have to get back there? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no place like home when you have to go abroad during a pandemic. <laughs> and to be stuck at home with some teenagers and no international air tickets and not even a library card that was functional because the library is very closed. Where do you travel? except in your imagination. So it's been my experience for most of my life that when I felt mental incapacity crowding upon me, I need to dig into my imagination and find something new to see. And Oz, interestingly enough, was still there, despite the fact that I hadn't visited it in 10 years. But it surprised you that it was still there. Well, not really. I knew it was gonna be there. I just thought somebody else can unroll those maps after I'm dead and, and see what happens next. I didn't expect to be the one to be doing it myself. I'm always interested in process, so do you, my, I guess my first question is, do you normally go away to write? And so what is your process if you're at home in writing? Well, I don't normally go away. I only go away in, in my mind, as, as it were. Uh, and the process, Jared, is not much different from how I developed it when I was in third and fourth grade, which is I buy a new pen <laughs> and I buy a new notebook where the, it hasn't been messed up with smudges or bad spelling errors. And I start on the first page and I start writing by hand. So you're writing this during the pandemic. How much of the themes of this world, the pressures we're all under, the stresses, how much do they work their way into your novel? I'd say in this case, uh, quite a bit. I've always used it, uh, this, these particular creative efforts, as a kind of way to consider what is happening in the contemporary moment in which I'm living and try to find a way to survive it. So the book, The Brides of Maricor, starts on an island that not only the seven inhabitants can't get off, they don't even know anything about the world beyond the island in which they've been raised since infancy. So that feels sort of pandemic-y, doesn't it? Well, that's, uh, as you're talking, I'm thinking the, the world changed so much and so quickly. We, we, we careened from one thing to the next. So uh, is there a lot of careening in the novel too as, you're, as you in, the, in, in this world are adjusting and writing about this world? Uh, yeah, yes, there is. Because one of the things that happens in this book, and it, indeed it happens in most of my uh, books that are set in, in the alternate universe that includes Oz, uh, is the friction between the lives of common, humble, perhaps not very well educated individuals and the socio-political dynamics that strangle their lives and their world. Well, going back to your worlds, is it, was it, even though you're returning to the world of Oz, as you say, we're now dealing with the descendants of the characters we know from the original Wicked, do you, was it hard at all to leave those characters behind and start to think about the, the, the next generation? 
It is no harder to think about the next generation than it is to turn from the, the casket of your great grandmother and take your great nephew in your arms, even at the service, and say, here we are together still. Let's, let's see what life has to offer. What about the fans? I mean, fans of your stories are so ravenous between, in between the theater adaptation, your books, of course. I'm going to ask you about the film in a yeah. moment, uh, the upcoming film, that is. But how much allegiance do you feel? Do they ever filter in? Do you think, oh, well, look, maybe, maybe this is the misery, the Stephen King misery story, right? <laughs> I, I, I can't do this or I can't do that. That might upset them. I might get my ankle slashed by a, <laughs> smashed by a sledgehammer. I have, I've had those, I have had those worries in the past. Luckily, my, my ankle, my ankles are no longer attractive enough, <laughs> enough for the sledgehammer. So I, I feel like I've escaped that, that particular future. Um, my fans have been extremely respectful by following me in directions in which they didn't know I was going to turn. And, and they don't always agree with what I've done. Lots of times I, I, get, uh, I get revisions of, you know, the last chapter should have gone like this. Here, here's 40 pages of handwritten material so you can see how you should have done it. You know, pay attention next time and do it better. All that suggests to me is that the world that is alive to me is also alive to my readers. That makes me very happy. So what was it like to experience? You were just in New York for the reopening of Broadway. And what better emblem than the reopening of Broadway than to see Wicked back on stage? You were one of the central figures, in addition to some of the original cast who were there. What was that like? Well, it was, um, all I can say is 18 years ago when Wicked opened and there was a Broadway premiere, I thought nothing could be more exciting than this ever in my life. But I did not anticipate a pandemic. The fact is that of the 1,700 people in the room, all vaccinated and masked, there were maybe only two who had never seen the play before. <laughs> so that every piece of stage business got its own round of applause. People started laughing at jokes before they were said. It was really, really thrilling. When at the bottom of act one, Elphaba lifts up and, and sings the last verse and chorus of Defying Gravity. She lifted up and she's like, it's me. And the entire 1,700 people lifted up too and started screaming. Well, I can't let you leave without asking about the film. I understand that they're beginning to assemble for, for filming the long, long awaited film adaptation of the musical, uh, which is an adaptation of your story. Right. What can you tell us about it? As far as I know, the principal casting has not begun yet. But the teasers are out there every two or three days. You know, it's like, a, you know, like getting fortune cookies. Like, who, who's it going to be? Well, so I have to ask. So who, so who was the first more than 20 years ago who could play Elphaba and who now? In my mind, Glinda was played by Melanie Griffiths, you know, working girl era yeah. with lots and lots of curly hair. <laughs> she has a high voice, too. Uh, and uh, Elphaba was played by Katie Lang. So that was... 28 years ago or so, uh, I think there must be people who are thinking of Ariana Grande for Alphaba, given that I know she loves the songs and she loves the role. And I don't know about Galinda. I'm a real fan of Anna Lee Ashford. I don't know if you know her. I've, I think, I've seen her many times. I yeah. think she is just terrific. Well, Gregory McGuire, always such a pleasure to speak with you. We'll compare notes after the film comes out. Absolutely. I, I can't wait. Thank you so much, Jared, for having me. It's time for Arts This Week, your download of the latest arts and culture events in and around town. As the saying goes, we can't go home again. But what if we have to? That's the premise of a new lyric stage company show called Fabulation or The Re-Education of Undine by Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Lynn Nottage. Undine is living large, riding her Ivy League education, running a boutique New York PR firm, and corralling celebrities. But after her husband absconds with all her money and the FBI comes calling, she's bounced back to Brooklyn. To understand what a blow this is to the image she has created for herself, she once told a magazine that her family had perished in a fire. To her, that was a much easier truth than confessing that she came from struggle. 
Undine is the name of a lead character in Edith Wharton's 1913 novel, The Custom of the Country. So with that as her springboard, Lynn Nottage has crafted her own updated comedy of manners. We watch her, Undine, reconcile who she thinks she's supposed to be, which is pretty bougie, as she admits, with the reality of her upbringing. No silver spoon, but parents who worked hard as security guards, a brother grappling with PTSD from his military service, and a grandmother with an unfortunate drug habit. Often wickedly funny, this production of Fabulation draws us in with the wicked truth of what our backgrounds say about us, or rather, what other people say they say about us. For years, the curatorial team behind the exhibition Designing Motherhood at the Mass Art Art Museum tried to get this show off the ground. Time and again, they were told nobody would want to see a whole show examining the arc of human reproduction. This is, of course, despite the fact that we all have a connection to this material and that we're all born. Finally, wiser institutions, including Mass Art, prevailed. Flash forward, and the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade makes this incredibly thoughtful and insightful show more relevant than ever. It walks us through 150 years of design, thought, and stories around pregnancy, birth, contraception, and more how it's been fashioned by designers and interpreted by artists. It highlights the painfully slow process of developing devices and methods actually suitable for women, the racial disparity in medical care, and we see contemporary artists like photographer Tabitha Soren and Boston sculptor Allison Crony Moses delivering intensely personal takes on the subject. The Boston Public Library has one of the most extraordinary collections of books, art, and manuscripts in America. Its special collections department requires nearly seven miles of shelving to house its treasures, from early Shakespeare folios to original prints by artists like Toulouse-Lautrec to the Bible on which Mayor Michelle Wu swore her oath. The department has just completed a years-long $15.7 million renovation and now reminds us the collection is available to everyone. You don't have to be a scholar, an author, or have any other special credentials to gain access to this wealth of material. To see and read for yourself an original printing of the Declaration of Independence or the abolitionist paper The Liberator. All you need to do is make an appointment, and this wealth of materials is yours to experience. After all, the library's motto is free to all. Ancestry and Legacy is at the heart of the new Museum of Fine Arts Boston exhibition, Touching Roots. It's an installation that celebrates blackness and the joy of creation that comes through cultural connections, how they're passed from generation to generation, from continent to continent. Here we find artists of the Americas working throughout the 20th and 21st centuries and tapping into their layers of heritage, following the threads of spiritual beliefs and practices. For the artists who haven't traveled to Africa, they conjure the motherland of their imagination. We also venture back to the 1960s and 70s, as artists responded to the calls of Pan-Africanism, when African countries fought for independence. Two artists in particular strike me here, Lois Melu Jones, the first black woman to graduate from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. She roamed the world from the 1930s to the 70s filling her canvases with her impressions, and Stephen Hamilton, a contemporary Boston artist representing a Dorchester High School student as a legendary African leader. Next week, keep an eye out for the Concord Festival of Authors. The 30th anniversary of this town-wide literary celebration kicks off with a host of writers talking about their work. I'll be there talking to Gregory Maguire, the author of Wicked. This is your arts download. I'll see you back here and in Concord next week. Earlier in the show, we saw how the portrait of Michelle Obama is resonating with visitors to the MFA. Now we meet the artist behind that painting. 
Amy Sherald became an international name after the portrait's unveiling, and people flocked to its permanent home at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. Then, in 2020, Sherald painted a serene and ethereal portrait of Breonna Taylor for Vanity Fair magazine. As you'll see, Cheryl describes her work as American realism. I paint portraits because growing up, it was what I considered art. I mean, it was what I saw in encyclopedias of what represented art, so becoming an artist meant being able to render the figure. I knew that I wanted to be an artist around the time that I was in the second grade. I'm not sure I knew what that meant but I knew that drawing was something that I liked to do, and I knew that I would rather do that than be around people. It found me. Yeah, I, I did not find that style, that style found me. I don't really have a descriptor for my style. I loosely attach myself to the genre of American realism. Being that I consider myself mostly self-taught, it's just how I paint. It's how I see, it's how I paint. My subjects are people of color because I choose to paint and put out in the world idealized versions of myself. Also realizing that if you look at the art historical canon, there's a lack of representation of people that look like me. And that was enough reason for me not to wanna paint anybody else but myself. I don't place my figures within a context because I want the viewer to have a singular experience with the person that's in the portrait. The person that's in the portrait, they're aware of the viewer, and they're aware that they're in this painting, if you, if you will. So since my work is a meditation on photography, a lot of the images that were taken of African Americans at one point in time were anthropological, so it's, it's also a critique on that frontal position. It's a soft confrontation, and I also hang my paintings a little bit lower than they would normally be hung because I want them and the viewer to actually have a real interaction. For me, Michelle Obama's portrait, beyond the professional and the historical aspects of it, I think it changed who I was as a woman. I think it gave me permission to ask for more of myself and ask more of others. Success has not changed me. It has given me more agency to do things that I want to do in the community. It's given me social leverage. I don't consider myself an activist, but I consider myself a humanist and somebody who is aware of what I have and what other people don't have and to share what I have gained with other people. I see myself evolving as a painter at this point mostly because I have a bigger budget and so it's going to be easier for me to make some of these larger paintings that I've been wanting to make for years but just didn't have the money to, to make them. And I'm not putting any pressure on myself to become a different person. I just am pursuing my practice in the same way that I would but with the ability to fund some of the bigger ideas that I have. And that is all for this edition of Open Studio. Next week, how an entirely new art form came to be. We visit Step Africa. As always, you can visit us online at gbh.org slash openstudio. And you can see us first on youtube.com slash gbhnews. Remember, too, to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at OpenStudioGBH. I'm at the Jared Bowen. Every Friday, Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan offer up live performances on Boston Public Radio. So we leave you now with the Neve Trio, performing at our Boston Public Library studio in August. I'm Jared Bowen. Thanks for watching.
Hold on to your seats, put on your strap on your seat belts. This is Piazzolla at his best as played by Neve Trio. Here they are. <laughs> 